enactment and, re and recognition of the vital role played by national and locally led NGOs, also known as localization and agency. So the CHS Alliance, so we've talked about core humanitarian standards, but now we also talk about the alliance that carry out the standards. There are nine, nine aspects, nine commitments involved in the core humanitarian standard. The CHS Alliance is a membership-based global alliance that ensures there's a uniform and collective action to make aid work better for those we all aim to serve. This is done by, as I said, applying a set of nine core humanitarian standards. We're not gonna talk about the standards now, that's the technical aspect of it. What we want to talk about is how all actors involved in planning, managing, and or implementing programs of support should and could be involved in the membership, in the CHS Alliance, in order to make everybody's life in the ground, the people that we are aiming to serve better. <coughs> I'm going to play a video now from a small organization in Pakistan who are currently, even though they're very low resourced, are currently implementing CHS Alliance, CH, sorry, the core humanitarian standards. <laughs> Hi everyone, this is Samreen Kaimi, the focal person to CHS Alliance from Fast Rural Development Program based in Pakistan. FRDP is a local organization aiming at facilitating the rural communities in a way that they can be empowered to secure their rights with command over the resources and capabilities to manage the process of sustainable development. FRDP's major focus is to promote WASH, FSL, emergencies, disaster risk reduction, education, women and youth empowerment, sustainable community engagement, climate change, and good governance. FRDP joined uh, CHS Alliance back in 2018 because we found CHS Alliance are very competitive and conducive in the sense of organizational development. We wanted our organization to adopt the best standard to summarize FRDP as per global standard. As a member of CHS Alliance, we feel FRDP is a strong local actor, consider ourselves part of the global community, and our house is to keep the present and future needs on the humanitarian action. Our 90% staff and volunteers are aware of the CHS nine commitments, having basic training before landing on field. FRDP participated in CHS line self-assessment to make the system more transparent, comprehensive, to get effective implementation in humanitarian response mechanism and development projects. In result, our donors and other actors are recognizing FRDP as more responsible, committed, strengthened, and effective responders. Our compliance became easier than ever before in the means of different actors, including government authorities, donors, alliances, and networks. FRDP accelerating its work in localization through bottom-up approaches, as well as communities are practicing power in decision-making. They are educated about CRM on very initial stage. Currently, our organization is aiming at developing a full-scale community development models to inspire collective action for sustainable development. In short, CHS Lines is a platform who helps local organizations to strengthen their responses by providing them a complete understanding of humanitarian standards. So local actors can be as capable as the international organization. With the limitation of funds, CHS Lies is making organization strengthen with the knowledge by providing different platforms. That is all about us. Hope to see you all on board holding success stories in hand. Feel free to contact us if you have any question or need more information about us. Thanks for listening. Goodbye and stay blessed. Good afternoon. That was Samreen. Yeah, I went to the bank this morning. Samreen yeah, couldn't join us today, but who, who oh, could? Oh, is oh, Ahmed from building. Sir, sorry, people, could you please mute yourselves? Anyone who's not speaking should be on mute. Thank you, Rachel. So basically what we want to do in this part of the, of the session is hear from some of the small organizations who have uh, resource challenges, both in terms of human resources and in terms of finances, to hear from them uh, how they have managed becoming a member of the CHS Alliance. We're going to hear from Abdullah Ahmed now, 
uh, from Building Foundation for Development in Yemen about the opportunities and the challenges for a small organization like his own to join the CHS Alliance. So over to you, Abdullah. Hello guys, uh, how are you doing? It's an honor being here. Okay, uh, my name is Abdullah Ahmed from Yemen. I am currently working as a meal officer in BFD. Uh, BFD works in wide uh, domain in all parallel and innovative manner. Um, the first, <clears throat> uh, the first one is uh, carrying out multi-sectoral emergency responses projects aimed to improve the humanitarian issues and needs in different sectors. We joined the CHS Alliance in 2020 as we faced many challenges and obstacles while applying the CHS or core humanitarian standards. Uh, one of the significant challenges uh, is uh, training all the employees and raising their awareness. Uh, such training would take a lot of money, uh, time, and uh, awareness. And another significant challenge is the language barrier as the language used here in Yemen is Arabic. That's why we have to, uh, we had to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, add or invent another version or translate another version of CHS into Arabic. Um, you know, uh, applying the CHS and BFD current tools related to the project life cycle, raising capacities and training all employees on, the, on them requires a lot of money, time and awareness. Uh, such challenges faded away uh, because we joined the CHS Alliance network. And the most important thing that motivated us to join was, uh, you know, to provide, to provide uh, humanitarian aid uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, another reason is that uh, all donors uh, started to focus on heavily on uh, CHS uh, as they contracted with third party monitoring. Uh, so they monitor those organizations and they assess organizations uh, who are applying the CHS. Uh, such vital reasons encouraged us a lot to join the Alliance and completed a validated self-assessment in order to identify gaps on how we were, on how well we are implementing the standards. Uh, with the help of the Alliance, we devised a plan to work on uh, those gaps and to close those gaps to get on the right track. Uh, I would like to share an example with you guys uh, since we were started working on the fourth commitment or the fourth criteria which is a uh, humanitarian response is based on communication, participation, and feedback. And the fifth commitment, which is all complaints are welcomed and addressed. We, uh, the, the beneficiary satisfaction got increased from 40 uh, to 90. Such also contributed, uh, such also contributed a lot uh, to gain community affected by crisis, local authority and donors trust. So uh, not only would you pool more funds through applying the CHS, but you would gain community affected by crisis trust by putting them at the heart of the intervention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. So essentially, um, we see also the same as Samreen and the same as Abdullah, see the huge value in joining CHS and for us to get verified. The reason we really want to do that, I mean, there are very positive soundings from the donors, etc. but also because it is the right thing to do, because we can be part of a community of practice, because we can serve persons with disabilities in a way that can make us more accountable to our partners, to funders, and most importantly, to all those people that we exist to serve. So essentially what we believe and I have to get rid of the chat off my thing, that membership of the CHS Alliance is about raising the standard for people in crisis. And it's about holding ourselves to account. So thank you very much for listening. This was the, the very quick whistle stop tour of CHS Alliance, the why and the how. What we're going to hear about now is uh, the kind of various aspects of for European as well as for locally led organizations in the Global South. We're going to hear Rachel and Bonventure, the expert of CHS Alliance. 
talk a little bit more in detail. We'd love to hear from you in the chat. We'd love to hear any concerns you have, any issues that you might want to raise, any positive aspects for those of you who are doing it. And we will, as Rachel said, we will then be forming a frequently asked questions document that we will be sharing with everybody. So we, the aim of this is to help you to learn more about CHS Alliance. So thanks a million, everybody. And over to you, Rachel and Bonaventure. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, so I was just saying that we we had practiced this uh, myself and Bonna yesterday and we managed to get it to under 15 minutes. Hopefully we can do that again. So uh, so welcome. Welcome Bonaventure. Uh, and for anyone that doesn't uh, know, this is Bonaventure Sokpa. He is the senior advisor on the core humanitarian standard and outreach at CHS Alliance. So he leads on the Alliance's work to reach out to national and local organizations, bringing CHS closer to the people we serve. Welcome. So can you give us a brief uh, rundown on what is the CHS as a standard and what is the CHS Alliance? And what is the verification scheme we've heard mentioned? I know there's three methods. Thank you very much, Rachel. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. And uh, I hope I will be able to, in a very few words, to explain and clarify these three distinct elements around the CHS. So let's start with the standard itself, the core humanitarian standard on quality and accountability. It's a standard made up of nine commitments who are made to people affected by crisis. So these standards have been developed by the sector for the sector. It was published by three copyright holders, CHS Alliance, Sphere, and Group UAV in 2014 after a very large consultation. So this is briefly what I want to say on the standard itself. For the CHS Alliance, um, it's a membership organization, as it has been already said, founded in 2015. All our members, uh, 150 plus members, are committed to apply the CHS. This is why we are together as a community committed to make aid work better for people. And the CHS Alliance uh, welcome all type of organizations, small, big, everyone is welcome all over the, the world. This is the alliance. Let's look at the verification. CHS is made in the way that is verifiable. This is the, the strength of the CHS. And the CHS verification, we define it as a structured systematic process to assess the degree to which an organization's work meets the CHS commitment. So the, the CHS verification can be done based on the CHS verification scheme which encompass three options. These three options are made in the way that everyone can have access to it, make it accessible. The first one is CHS self-assessment. This is led by the organization uh, with support from the CHS Alliance. We have revised the methodology last year and published a new methodology to, con sorry, to considerably uh, reduce the internal resource that it takes. We have a second option that is CHS independent verification that uh, provides the organization with a, an assessment through an independent external audit. And we have a last one, CHS certification, also conducted through an external audit, but this is to demonstrate compliance with the CHS. So I have to mention that the CHS verification, independent verification and certification are provided by an independent organization which called Humanitarian Quality Assurance Initiative, HCI. They have a subsidy fund in place to cover up to 90% of the audit cost for small and national organizations. This is what I, I, I want to say about the three distinct elements that are linked to the CHS. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. That was very clear. Um, we heard from two of the locally led organizations about uh, how they and the communities they work with are benefiting from being a member of the CHS Alliance so that it was worth the investment that they put in, even though they are small. 
And there are on this call as well, um, organizations also in, in Ireland and Europe that struggle with resource poverty. Can you advise how and why an in, a smaller NGO can go down this verification route? Yes, um, I would say because the CHS commitments are made by all organizations, small or big, who are working with people in, uh, uh, with uh, vulnerability. And I will say the sector as a whole will not be able to meet the CHS commitment to people affected by crisis if we don't have all the organizations involved. I know that some of small organizations might be a little bit afraid of the standard and they won't, uh, they won't be able, they, they can think that they won't be able to meet the, the standards or, or go through the verification because that will take a lot of resources. My message is to say that the CHS verification, the good news is that it's about learning an improvement process. And the CHS verification process is made in a way that it is accessible, accessible to anyone, any okay. organization. Okay, and, and what will achieving verification do for the organization and for the people we're trying to help? No, personally, I want to say, this is why I'm very dedicated to CHS. I see in the CHS a tool to ensure people in, uh, in vulnerable situation are treated safely with respect and dignity. This is what the CHS is doing. And this is why I think this should be applied. So applying the CHS confirms the engagement of the organization to work toward this element that I mentioned and achieve great, greater quality and accountability of their work with people uh, in, vulnerable, in vulnerable situation. The experience of application of the CHS showed that both people uh, in, uh, affected by crisis and staff uh, feel more confident in their relationship. We, we heard that from Abdullah uh, a, a few minutes ago. So this is one of the biggest uh, uh, relation, uh, benefits. Mm. It builds, builds on that relationship, builds trust as well. So yes. what, what, what is the scale of the investment that a small NGO would need to make for this? Good. As I said before, the CHS verification process is made accessible to any organization. So based on our experience and estimation that we have, an organization going through the self-assessment using the new methodology that we have published uh, last year will only need to do this uh, the following element. First is to identify a focal point who will use uh, up to 15, 15 days, one, five days uh, throughout the process, depending on the size of the organization. We know small organization, they spend less time because they don't have a lot of uh, uh, documentation. The second uh, element is that each of the staff will have to take 30 minutes or 40 minutes to fill in a survey to help the organization get, gathering information. And the last thing is that the organization will need to plan uh, for a community consultation. We ask for a minimum of 20 uh, interviews per country. So it's not something that is very huge. For external verification, the organization can apply uh, for the subsidy fund I mentioned earlier. I would like to add before I finish this, there is something that is important for me to mention that the work an organization is doing with the CHS verification needs to be done anyway through a different mechanism to answer donors' questions and requirements. So CHS Alliance is advocating to make the effort organizations are putting in the CHS verification to make this effort recognized by donors. And the verification result should be considered in the relationship with donors. We have seen some of the donors starting to consider that. We see that's very important because that's making organizations save resources and time. The thing that you need to do with, for different uh, donors, you do it once, 
and then you share the result with different uh, donors and partners that will really make you save time. Okay, okay. So if organizations don't feel that they have the resources, either financial or human resources, to carry out all the necessary steps to achieve full CHS membership, is there any help or support available to them? This is a very good question. I thank you for asking that because regarding the CHS Alliance membership, my first message to all small organizations is that they should not be stopped by the membership fees. The Alliance fees structure is made in a way that the members they are, uh, make it accessible to anyone. Small organizations pay small amounts. And if you are a small organization based in low country, uh, you pay less. So this is to make sure that everyone gets access to, to the uh, Alliance. We welcome any kind of organization willing to join the CHS and engage uh, uh, with us in discussion. So don't be afraid, come to us. We can have a discussion and see what's the, what is the situation and how you can engage with the, with the CHS. Don't be stopped by the, the, the fees. And to, to support the improvement journey, we also have community of practices and regular uh, events in place to make, to gather our members in the way that we can share good practices and, um, and experience. And members, they appreciate that very, uh, very much. Uh, we are proud of that. And we are also, we have seen organization uh, involved in the, in the group verification. They have been doing a, a capacity and experience sharing work that is very interesting. We have seen teams moving from a country to another to strengthen capacities of their peers to make sure that all organizations involved in the verification, uh, they, they keep a good level of quality. This is very inf interesting to, to, to see that. Mm, yeah, peer, peer support in that way. That's great. Um, and just pushing on because of the time, um, the Disability Reference Group, which is an international um, reference group of uh, uh, human rights and um, uh, rights people with disability and international uh, governmental organizations. Uh, it, so the Disability Reference Groups advocates for membership of CHS Alliance as compliance with standard makes us report how, how well or not so well we might be um, doing at breaking down barriers and supporting people with disabilities in times of crisis. So can you talk a little bit about that, that uh, accessibility, the component? Uh, the good news about that is that the CHS verification allows us to see how verified organizations are doing regarding some key thematic areas. We see that through the CHS uh, indexes, which include all indicators in the CHS addressing a particular thing. And we have a disability and inclusion index, which includes indicators ensuring all type of people, uh, including people with disability are properly involved in the, in the response and their needs addressed in humanitarian response. So once an organization is verified, we can clearly see if it's performing very well on that. If not, they will need to uh, reinforce their actions and improve on that. Okay, so it's a way of getting a good amount of, of data for yourselves and, and for the sector as a whole as well. And, and in terms of the CHS uh, supporting something similar uh, with the issue of um, uh, protection from sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, is that, is that another thematic area or um, how is that tracked? Uh, that's good because we have also another index on the protection from sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, PSEH that we have revised last year to make sure that it's up to date and encompass all key aspects of the subject that have been raised in the uh, last years. Unfortunately, when we look at the result, when we put together all the indicators uh, addressing that, the average score in, is low and show the challenge we have in the sector on this issue. So we use this kind of result as a basis for our advocacy work to make the sector, the sector um, change and address these key issues. Okay, 
Okay, thank you, Bonnet. Thank you for your time. Um, we are just on time again, so I think uh, I don't think uh, Sharon's going to be too angry at us either. So <laughs> I, I know she had a lot in the session. So um, uh, thank you very much. I think that was really helpful and very very clear to to people. So you might get a lot of questions after this, I'm afraid, but uh, we'll uh, we'll get answers from you and we'll put that into um, the frequently asked questions document that will be shared with everyone afterwards. So thanks very much. And I think we're handing over to Hazel now because there's a there's a poll to be done. Hi, everyone. So this poll was created by Sharon. So I'm just going to launch it now and you can answer. So there's three questions in the poll and you can answer either one answer or as many answers as you think are correct. So it's a multiple choice. I'll give you all two or three minutes just to fill in the poll. If anyone has any issues answering the poll, just let me know. You can either send me a chat or just raise your hand. Okay, guys, I'm going to give you just another 30 seconds to finish the poll. And I'm just going to close in the poll now and I'm going to hand it over to Sharon, who's going to discuss your responses. Thanks, everyone. Hi, guys. So, no, just very quickly, the reason we did this poll, because we wanted to see what your thoughts were around how the CHS membership and CHS Alliance is progressing. And basically, the answer is that all of those donors value the CHS Alliance and the core humanitarian standards, and all of them use funding sorry, uh, use their calls to encourage organizations. So they fund organizations who are involved with CHS Alliance. So surprisingly, 100% of, of those donor organizations globally recognize CHS as an important aspect of humanitarian aid and development assistance. The same, the CHS Alliance process encourages, ensures that people and communities vulnerable to risk and affected by disaster, conflict or poverty it influences quality assistance 
those people on the ground who previously didn't have a voice now have a voice. They can access complaint mechanisms. They can access quality assistance. They are now also participating in their own uh, futures. So they can access quality assistance. They also, CHS Alliance also improves safeguarding and PSEAH. As Bonaventure said, that is an issue that we as a sector are lacking in at the moment. And the CHS Alliance ensures that people who are affected by disaster and humanitarian and development needs can be safeguarded and that we're all held accountable. And basically, as I said, that we're all held accountable. So 100%, all of those aspects support people on the ground who are vulnerable to risk. And finally, all of those, so these were, this was a trick survey, I'll have to admit, because all of those uh, supports are available by the CHS Alliance. So if you want to become a member of CHS Alliance, if you feel that implementing core humanitarian standards is important for your organization and for the people that you aim to serve, you have access, as Bonna said, to many, many uh, different support systems, peer-to-peer -peer learning, external verification subsidy fund. So HQAI, I can't pronounce it properly, HQAI actually has a subsidy fund that you can apply for. And there's a training discount for small organizations. So there is no reason whatsoever that you shouldn't be able to support and be involved in the CHS Alliance as a global membership. Because as Bonner said, the bigger the membership, the wider the spread of the support and the better access to quality assistance that the people in crisis have. And the better that they, we are all held accountable to the people that we all exist to serve. So thanks a million for taking part. I appreciate and I hope you have learned something from that survey because I see that some of the answers were 70, 60, 40, et cetera. And I hope that this has, has helped you understand a little bit more about the organize, about the membership. Over to you, Rachel. Ah, great, thanks. I think we're breaking into breakout rooms now, uh, which has been set up. So there's just going to be, I'm oh, sorry, I got written instructions there a second ago, so let me just check them. There's going to be three sessions, three uh, sections for the breakout rooms. And um, we're basically gonna split people into two groups, but then a third group is gonna stay in the main session. So in the main session will be the one with the captioners and interpreters, they'll stay here. So for anybody that, uh, that is needing those, requiring those or finding it easier to, to have those, uh, do please send a message or a request. But um, I think we've set up the groups appropriately. So it should work out with the three separate groups. There'll be uh, somebody within each um, group from VC who will be taking notes for the questions and the questions are um what do you perceive as a challenge for you as a small organization in joining the chs alliance and based on what you have heard do you what do you think is the most important benefit of chs membership and which of the chs uh, foci focuses localization pseah and disability inclusive development are most relevant to your organization? So there'll only be one question per group, as I understand it. <laughs> Someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that. I think it's one question per group. So the person, the VC representative in your group should have your question. Um, and we'll just have uh, just, just about 10 minutes to discuss that, and then we'll be feeding it back into the main group. Sorry, am I asking people to join the groups voluntarily or are people being split up? Colette and uh, Hazel. Um, so um, I, 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 I can't see what people are seeing on screen at the moment. Um, so but everybody will, uh, if they can just uh, choose a room to join. Um, th the reason we're doing that is because we're leaving the main session open here, as Rachel said, um, for the accessibility features. So. Um, those people who uh, are in need of captioning and international sign language interpretation remain in this session here. And this, um, this session here will be question three, which is the, around the CHS foci lo localization, PSEH and disability inclusive development. So if you want to be part of that group, stay in this room here, please. I see people are choosing their groups as they go.
Yeah, I did actually see a call to go to a room myself. So uh, and we've just got a request to put the call out yes, again. Okay. If that's possible, that would be great. Um, um, all right, because I'm just I'm just going to see I'm seeing people um, joining there at the moment. So <laughs> some people don't have have seen it. So I might just. Um, So I think we, um, we're we left with our, our session here now. Um, if uh, we want to turn on our videos and have a chat about um, question uh, three, which is um, around the focus of the core humanitarian standard, localization, PSEAH, and disability inclusive development. Um, which of these do you think is the most important for your own organizations? If anybody has any comments on that. And Rose um, is our um, is the person who will be reporting back on this. If anyone, if you want to turn on your cameras, if you're staying in this room, if you want to turn on your cameras, and uh, we can have a chat about it, about this. So hi, Colette. Um, hi. I just, I'll kick start it because I think people are a little bit shy. <laughs> We're all tired, Sharon. After, yeah. It's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I suppose what I found really surprising and very, very disappointing, actually, was how badly we as a sector, given all the scandals, all the problems, all the issues that have been around, I mean, but have been really highlighted over the last decade around PSEAH and how badly we're still doing in that issue. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think they're probably all very relevant, but yeah. for me, that's- Sharon, sorry, could, I, I just want to interrupt because a question came up in the, in the chat box earlier. Um, could we explain to people who don't know what PSEAH means and what the relevance is? Because somebody asked to, uh, to explain the acronym. Okay, so Prevention of Sexual Abuse, Exploitation and Harm is PSEAH. And that is where you know, the development sector, humanitarian aid sector has a do no harm kind of focus. And that is what we're all we all sign up to when we get involved in this work. But actually what we are what we've learned over the decades is that we both inadvertently and sometimes unfortunately purposely do harm to the people that we're supposed to be helping because these people are incredibly vulnerable. So basically, and there has been, I mean, we've heard about the Oxfam scandal, we've heard about lots of other scandals where people who are vulnerable are being used for sex, they're being abused, they're being harmed in the field by other develop, by development and humanitarian aid actors, both local and international. So there is no finger being pointed any, in any one direction. And this is something that if we're trying to help, these people should not be vulnerable to that. Absolutely, to make things to make their lives worse instead of better. We're there to make their lives better as much as we can. Okay. So I found that really, really disappointing. And I think that it's great that CHS Alliance is focusing on that as, a, as an indices, that they are reporting back on that. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else yeah. has any comments about that. I mean, I'm not yeah. saying the other two things are not very, very important. But I just found that I was really disappointed about that, the yeah. reporting that that is the worst of the three areas that is the one that we're performing worst in. Yeah. Um, Tumas, has Abilis, um, uh, have you, you, you're in the process of implementing CHS or, or are you going yeah. down that road? So um, 
we are not actually officially a member of the alliance, but I think it's really about what kind of role Abilis is playing as a whole, because Abilis is not the humanitarian actor as per se, but what we are is a resource bank and a consultative bank uh, on the organizations in itself. I would actually say personally that I, I view the overall amount of guidelines and, and recommendations pretty exhausting and actually contra um, it's not very useful for the entire topic because we actually already have pretty well existing platforms on how to do inclusion um, at the different phases of the humanitarian aid and the DRG working group has gone on for a like year and a half. So I'm, I, I'm not, uh, it's important to educate people about them, but I'm actually not too fond of at the moment using energy or resources to develop any new guidelines or actually even in, like just how far we are in the field from where the sphere minimum standards would allocate or, or expect you to be. It's still like the, the gaps between existing and existing situation are are pretty vast. But I would like to say maybe what, what Sharon, you pointed out that to me that actually goes behind safeguarding and that goes like how to do a comprehensive safeguarding policy. And this is something where we are, because Abilis doesn't really send, uh, we observe, they monitor. So it's more about how to engage grassroots in learning about the safeguarding, but it's not, it's less relevant to us or not really relevant, but actually like more abstract in your day-to-day -day work for Abilis than to many other organizations. Because if an organization has their own people and hundreds of their own people, and when doing volunteering, for example, you have you have uh, uh, external actors as well. So actually, like I, the way we view safeguarding is, but um, basically everything you said goes under that. If say if there are safeguarding mechanism, and it works then those kind of things should not happen. And then if those kind of things do happen, it's, isn't it evidence-based that there is either no safeguarding policy in place or it's not really implemented, usually the latter one. Yeah, I suppose the, the key thing with the, the CHS Alliance is that they are reporting as a community of practice on it. So they're gathering information from all members because at the moment, previously, Although Sphere and other, you know, standard organizations do look at these things, we were getting disparate information. You know, there was no global approach to what is the sector as a whole doing and or not doing. And this is one of the key things that we're now able to get that information, gathering that data. It's the same for disability inclusive development. There wasn't, I mean, there are lots of different organizations that support DID, but we weren't able to get a picture of how well or how badly we were doing globally by all actors, not just one set of actors in the Western hemisphere or whatever, but CHS Alliance looks at actors globally and it doesn't distinguish one from the other. It doesn't say, well, this is how Westerns are doing. This is how the guys in Africa are doing. This is how the guys in Asia are doing. It says as a sector, as a whole, this is how we're doing. And that is really, really important. Yeah, uh, I think uh, from the field experience, I would agree with uh, Thomas, because uh, here when we talk of safeguarding, uh, we're including uh, different types of uh, harm that uh, could be a potential to uh, the children or the people we work with. Although I also agree that the people uh, who are meant to protect the children or the vulnerable communities are the ones who are the perpetrators, and yet they are meant to protect the, these uh, vulnerable groups of people. So to me, I, I would look more at uh, implementing and uh, implementing awareness programs and safeguarding and child protection instead of introducing something new that might uh, kind of uh, confuse people. Because they will be like, yes, we have PSHS something, and then safeguarding, what's the difference? So I think it would be better to strengthen the advocacy areas in safeguarding and child protection rather than introducing a new uh, a new a new component in the field. Although I would agree that uh, it would also be good uh, if these uh, 
organizations or communities are gradually uh, are gradually enticed to join the major group, the community of practice, where they can easily report. Because one of the major weaknesses in the field is that because of the cultural differences or cultural customs, many of such cases are not reported. But if you have a, a community of practice, different people from different uh, areas, but working on a particular issue, they can easily uh, influence each other to report such cases for handling and management in the development and humanitarian work. Thank you, Rose. Can I just ask Hazel, um, have we long left? Because I just want to send a note to the other rooms. Sorry, you're on mute there, Hazel. How Sorry, I would say just about a minute more, if you one minute, I'll just send a message to them. I'll yes, just say thank you for that, Rose. I want to just say something very quickly there. I don't want this to be about me, but actually, that's the kind of misunderstanding around the CHS Alliance. It's not introducing new approaches or new ways or new, uh, it's not asking you to do anything different. It's asking you what your policies and practices are, and it's gathering that information. So, if you already have them in place, then you're going to report back on that. If you don't have them in place, it's asking you to put them in place. So it's not, so it isn't a parallel approach to development and humanitarian assistance. It's integrated into what you're already doing or what we as organizations are expected to be doing to do our jobs. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations still aren't doing DID. They're not doing PSCAH properly and they don't do localization. Mm. So, so it's not asking you to do anything new or extra. It's, it's asking you to do what we need to be done already. So if you're doing it, it's, they don't want you to do anything new. If you're not doing it, yes, they do want you to do it. And it's reporting back and it's, data, it's gathering data. It's creating a commun community of practice. It's looking at a uniform global approach to development and humanitarian assistance, which we don't really have that much of. We have like Sphere, we have, but from for Sphere, a lot of, small organizations in the development context for want of a bit of term i don't like that term but they're not really heavily involved in spheres for example chs alliance is targeting everybody and that's i think one of the new and interesting things about it as well and donors love it and donors don't love something for no reason Great. Well, our breakout rooms now, so uh, are going to close just in a few seconds. Um, if anybody has any last comments, so we will hear in a, a short plenary then from uh, everybody when they come back. They're all arriving back now. Are we all back? We haven't lost anybody along the way in, in, a, in, in the virtual space. I think we have lost a couple of people. We're missing everyone from room one. <laughs> I was thinking we'd lost people. Yeah, they're it, all it coming back now. Wasn't a, it wasn't totally clear whether we had to leave ourselves or whether you were going no. to push us so out. The, 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 we were uh, Hazel started to close the room, so you had a few seconds left. I was so I think. We're all back almost. Now, are you gathering the feedback, Colette? Or is uh, is that supposed to be for me? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the, we're, we're going to just um, ha a chat to everybody um, and hear what was discussed in the, each of the individual rooms. And this is a recording, so we'll be able to go back and okay. um, get the information from that. Brilliant, that's fine. But we have some really good questions that were put into the chat as well for our FAQ document that we will produce after this. So I think we're done now. Yeah, I think everyone's back. Yeah. And Susan's put a question in there as well that we put into our... Okay. So, um, Rachel, do you want to, to do this or um, do you want me to... I can certainly just call on the people. Yes, um, so great. yeah, who, whoever was in group in group one, the VC rep in, in room one, I should actually have a list of them here, but I... Yeah, so in group one, um, we had um, Shane um, and the question there was, what do you perceive as a challenge or challenges for you as a small NGO or organization 
joining the CHS. Okay, well, we, 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 we batted it around for a few minutes. Um, we felt that resources was the key issue, um, you know, at least the perceived requirement for resources. Um, but uh, we, we did get, we had Bono in the room, so he was able to tell us that it, it wasn't that expensive. It was a, not a, per, a percentage, but it was a, a, a sliding scale depending on your total earnings in the year. So it could be from as little as 300 Swiss francs uh, for a smaller organization. Um, but we were talking about the amount of time that it takes to, you know, outside of your, of your normal, what we considered our normal uh, routine. Uh, was a challenge. Um, the, we also talked about awareness, um, you know, awareness of CHS in it, as an entity and, and, and the importance of us as a humanitarian stroke development organization being part of, of that. And that if we weren't aware of it, how would we, would we move in that, um, in that uh, area? Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at, 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 at that. That's fine, thanks. Very succinct. So, uh, uh, Susan, the second question there was based on what you have heard. What do you think is the most important benefit of CHS membership? Yes, thanks, Rachel. Um, so, we the, um, in room two, we had myself, Pauline, Marina, Brenda, and uh, yourself, Rachel. Thanks for joining us. So, um, yeah, I think we had Abdullah as well, but he was very quiet. <laughs> He didn't say anything. Oh, I didn't even realise. Sorry, I'm very didn't sorry. Didn't put his camera on. See, it's was, his own fault. I was, I was busy writing notes. Apologies. So, yeah, we had lots of positive feedback on that question. So uh, the, the benefits include, um, on a, a firstly, very, I suppose, very practical, the ability to access donor funding on a reliable basis. So the fact that it, it's, it's, um, it's, you're receiving a recognised standard that's respected by funders. Um, the peer support, um, so that's the ability to link then initially with more experienced organisations and then moving into uh, mutual learning and sharing um, the ability to learn from other organisations and to pass on your own learnings. Um, and um, as well as, as the standards being uh, say, uh, a quality standard, it's also uh, accountability focused. So, so we are, we are accountable. You, you can measure the fact that there are indices and um, so you, you will have a level of detail you can measure measure where you're at and what your progress is. So it should be easy to track um, your improvements and your impact over time. Um, it would, uh, the fact that it has to be continuously re-verified would serve as a continuous reminder on the, the focus on meaningful participation so you're, re, you're uh, re-verifying where you're at and you're getting um, good reminders of what you need to focus on in case you forget certain aspects. Um, uh, it helps you to provide high quality, relevant support. And uh, let me see. Uh, yes, the, the indices we've mentioned already, but they would help you to develop your capacity because you can clearly see the gaps and where, where you need to try to direct your resources. And um, nearly there, um, it's, it's a, a, a very uh, powerful way of promoting disability inclusion into a humanitarian action. Um, it's accessible to small organizations, not just the larger organizations with bigger budgets. So everybody is able to improve. And I think maybe just a couple more. Um, there was a very simple statement from one of the contributors earlier, which was, it makes aid work better for people. So that can't be bad. And um, I think finally, um, it, the sharing of the standards allows local actors to be as effective as external teams. So. I hope I've captured everything there. No, that seems very thorough. Um, we, we're going a little bit over time, but um, sorry, Sharon, did you want to jump in there? 
I do. I just wanted to note that even yeah. taking Shane's skill at brevity into account, the positives far, far, far <laughs> the negative and the difficulties. So thank you so much, Susan, because really, if you got that, if the group got that information from this one hour short presentation, then I'm delighted because that was what we were trying to do. So well done, everybody. You were listening. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we're nearly at the end, folks, but uh, we'll, we'll just keep you maybe another four, four minutes or so. Um, so the last question then was, which of the CHS foci focuses, I like the grammar there, uh, localization, PSEAH, and disability inclusive development are the most pertinent or the most relevant for your organization? So that was, that was Rose who stayed in the main session there. So can Rose feed back on that one? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think I'll categorize your answers in three, uh, in three areas. One, uh, what we acknowledge as a team, and then what uh, PSH, PSH is about, and what can be done to uh, going forward. Uh, in the group, we acknowledge that uh, people, people and organizations in the development and humanitarian sector have been uh, reported as being perpetrators to the people whom they are supposed to safeguard and protect. And uh, amidst that, there is no reporting that is done. So people don't take it as an initiative to report such cases, uh, probably due to different factors, including cult our cultures, different cultures, how we handle such information. And then uh, we acknowledge also that there is confusion between PSHS and safeguarding. Uh, we, we thought, some of us thought that maybe if you have child, uh, safeguarding and child protection, then you have everything covered that is under the PSHS. But we've acknowledged today that there is a, the PSHS is about uh, ensuring that you have the policies in place and you are uh, implementing them. It's only about uh, integrating the issues within the PSHS, within the existing safeguarding or uh, child protection uh, structures. And then, um, yeah, then going forward, uh, there is need to create awareness campaigns uh, in uh, among organizations to participate as groups that are working on a particular uh, a particular factor that is safeguarding the children and other vulnerable groups and um, other vulnerable groups within the sector and integrating it, not creating a new system, but integrating it into the existing uh, safeguarding structures within the organization and also to entice them uh, joining the community of practice uh, to the community of practice in reporting as a combined effort rather than dealing with it as an organization or as an individual. Okay, I've covered everything. We focused on PSHS by the we didn't go into localization and uh, inclusive development. <laughs> That's that's okay. Um, oh, yeah, if it was the subject of interest, uh, though, I did want to add that at the end of, of our group, I think it was Pauline uh, specifically said that obviously in terms of capacity building and so on, it's idea of localization, the idea of um, recognizing local circumstances, improving local capacity would obviously uh, be a big one for organizations such as VC. Okay, I think we're. Uh, I think we're officially done now guys so i can let everybody go and i just want to say thanks to everybody i assume uh, colette might want to say a few words as well um uh, but for, for me i just want to thank everybody for uh helping out uh, i hope it went relatively smoothly um and thanks to all the speakers and thanks very much for our sign language interpreters who i have found extremely impressive all the way through this and the captioners who, of course, I, I don't get to see, but they're uh, somewhere in the background working hard and trying to keep up with many accents and fast talking um, well, Irish and Italian people, particularly. <laughs> so thanks very much to them. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's gone really well. We got a lot out of it. So it's been great. Okay. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, you've been great at the continuity today and uh, keeping everything going and keeping the time really appreciated. 
um, uh, kept everything running so smoothly. Um, thank you to all our contributors in this session today, um, to, to Bona and Abdullah um, and to Sharon, of course, who uh, brought the whole thing together and Rachel for her interview. Um, I also really want to thank our, um, our captioner, Shari, um, who um, have been awake quite early this morning to help us and uh, Robert and, and Oliver. And um, I, I don't know the name of our third um, uh, sign language interpreter, but thank you so much for your assistance and help today in the sessions and advising us on some technical issues. Um, we're really grateful for your presence throughout the day. It's been a long day and this has been quite a, a technical but very educational uh, session. Um, we will uh, be emailing everybody uh, all the resources that we can from these sessions um, over, the, over the coming days. But if you have any queries in the meantime, do drop us an email through the Eventbrite link or to myself directly and we can um, help you out with that. Um, I'll just hand over to Shane and uh, just say a few words to close the session and then we'll let everybody go. Thank you. Yeah, I think you said uh, everything. I just want to thank Colette uh, for uh, putting this together um, as this is the last of our, she did one last year with us and uh, this is the second one. And I think you'll all agree she, uh, she did very well. So again, thanks to our invited guests, to, our, to everybody that's here today. I really appreciate it and I hope it's been useful. And so to the next time, we'll continue the journey on disability and uh, we'll let you know how we get on. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.